Before we begin, this morning is Purim, so it's a great day. I hope that people were at Temple's uh, Megillah reading or, or, or did your own thing and uh, participated in all, all the Purim uh, traditions that we have. I want to share a few. If you haven't, we're giving out Shalach Monas here this morning, so that wants to be two different kinds of food. And you can give it to at least one other person. So I, I've, I've given out some nice shalach monas this morning. And another tradition that some people do is giving charity, especially to poor people. So if you're in contact with someone and you can give them directly, that's great. <clears throat> Ideally paying for another mitzvah, which is the, the festival meal. You're supposed to have a, a, a Purim meal, a seuda. So if you just, you know, have a glass of wine, say, say the Kiddush, like on Shabbat, just the blessing for the wine and some bread, and sit down with friends, maybe have a l'chaim, then that's that. Um, but in addition, yesterday, and you could do it again today, uh, we give charity in a special form that's three half dollars. You can see here, I've taped them together for ease. These are three American half dollars. That's to make up for the silver that Haman paid a chasve rush to try and kill us all. So usually the afternoon before Purim, but if you haven't, I've got it here in a box. And people have been <clears throat> essentially buying the three half dollars, then putting them in as charity. Um, so all kinds of great stuff you can do for Purim. And keep in mind, here in our class, we're not just doing this because it's a great Jewish thing and it feels right and it's a mitzvah. We're doing it very much to connect with this light that's impossible to bring into the world. In this chapter, we're learning about two kinds of divine light. There is the divine light that comes into the world or mimale, that you can connect with because you look at something, you're like, okay, this is, uh, this is a cell phone. The light that's making it, the energy that's making it right now exists. It's giving it a form. It doesn't change form. It's giving it the ability to create images on the front. It has power inside. It uh, doesn't have intelligence as far as we know, but it can communicate with me through towers. So I can understand the light that's making this because I can relate to it. But there's a second light, this light that preceded that or memale, and that's called the or sovev, the surrounding light, which we've been learning about in this chapter. That's a light that has nothing to do with this world, doesn't relate or manifest in any way, is completely hidden, and that's the light that we can actually bring right here into the physical world when we give shalach monas, when we give charity. And even though it's completely hidden, and that's, of course, connected to the holiday of Purim, because Esther's name means hidden, Esther from Hester, even though that light is completely hidden, it's right here. We're all in that light, and we can actually reveal it every time we do a mitzvah or learn Torah. So now you have your Kabbalistic lens with which to see all the traditions, especially these Purim traditions today. And the more you meditate, and the more you bring that lens into your conscious mind, the more that becomes what you connect with when you do the mitzvah. You can get very, very excited. <laughs> uh, there's one question before I launch, yeah? Um, I just, the light of creation mm -hmm. on, you know, the first day. Yeah. Was that one, uh, my mom? The question is, <clears throat> that first light that was hidden away from the Sadiqim, that light you're talking about, right, that we read about, was that light or mamala or sovev? Uh, I'd have to research that. I don't know. I'm guessing the answer is both because it depends on what you're talking about, right? So if you're talking about Atsilus as being Or Sovev, Atsilus being the highest world, probably that was, that was Or Sovev. But if you're talking about other Kabbalah where that really is also Atsilus is a world and that's Or Mamala, now that original light was probably uh, 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 something different, right? So like we said last week, it really all depends what the conversation is. These are relative terms. The Alter Rebbe has given us a shortcut where basically the highest spiritual world that Silus, we're calling that Or Sovev, the surrounding light, just to have a simple conversation. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you the intricacies of that question. Good question, though. I want to back up, though, because we had a conversation after our last class and when we turned the camera off. We have great conversations here once the camera turns off. <laughs> They're all very quiet while we're recording and streaming. And then we, I press off, and they're like, can, can I, hold on, this reminds me, right? So it was suggested that I share uh, this insight 
because these chapters tend to kind of put your brain on tilt mode, right? Like those old, those old uh, 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 pinball machines, you know, you shake them too hard, they just go tilt and the game's over. And so we learn this stuff, like we're learning that Rambam said, God is the knowledge, the knower, and the known all together, and that no one can understand that. And everyone here is saying, this, this chapter is so difficult. It's so, I don't get it, it's so difficult. And I'm saying, well, obviously, the Rambam said, you, you're not going to understand this, right? So don't think it's difficult because you can't understand that concept, because no human being can understand that concept. But the idea that the thing I can't understand is that God is the knowledge knower known, that's that we can talk about, explain, that we all understand. So people are saying, oh, this chapter is so difficult. And I want to kind of share with you how, in particular, Chabad Chassidus creates an approach to, to understanding Kabbalah. So maybe we won't feel like these chapters are so difficult. Because the part that's difficult is difficult for every human. No one gets it, right? And that's two things. One is, uh, we got somebody coming in. Good. One is, this stuff is all above what our conscious minds can digest. Right? We talk about Ein Sof and Or Ein Sof as if this is something we can digest. We can't digest infinity. We can't. No one can. That being said, the Alter Rebbe found a way to explain these Kabbalistic concepts even to our conscious mind. Now, how he did it, you've been with us for years and years now, and you've been learning uh, many chapters of Kabbalah, so you can start to see that there's a way that even your conscious mind is able to absorb something about these ideas. Like, for instance, I, can, I can't understand what it means for God to be the knowledge, the knower, and the known altogether. For me, I know my cell phone, it's me. I have the image of my cell phone in my mind, there it is, that's my knowledge, and the thing that's known is a cell phone, and that's one, two, three things. They're all separate. There's me, there's everything I know about the cell phone in my mind, and then there's a cell phone, and we're not one thing. And I couldn't even understand what it would be like for me to be the cell phone and the knowledge and the knower. Can't get it. But watch this. Knowing that I can't know it, that is a form of knowledge. Negative knowledge. Knowing that I can't understand it, that in itself gives me a little handle on the thing that I didn't have before. Now that's a simple example, but when you go through this type of Kabbalah that the Alter Rebbe basically introduced to the world, you see that he's found ways that even our conscious mind can kind of get an indirect hold on it or get a sense of it. So that's one. Chabad Hasidus that uses Chochmah Bin and Dat, uses our intellect to understand something beyond us, we're just following this working of this genius who created a system where even our conscious mind can start to get a sense of things. He found ways of describing it through stories and examples. But there's a second approach of Chabad Chassidus that's also important for us to know, and it's, it's the core of what we're learning in the Tanya. And that is, it's not so much about my conscious mind understanding it, because who am I kidding, right? My conscious mind is finite and can only understand physical and temporal phenomena, and, and I never really can understand it. But the point is not so much to understand infinity, because give me a break. The point is to connect with God, connect with infinity. And for that, what matters is my emotions, because the heart can see much further and much higher than the mind can see. And that's why we're doing the system of meditation. So when we learn a chapter like this, and we're trying to understand and explain something about the infinite light and yada yada, it's less that my brain's actually going to somehow absorb this idea of infinity. It's more that once I have some foothold, some parallel that I can meditate on in my mind, now I'm creating emotions. I'm creating chesed, love. I'm creating awe, yira. And those emotions will connect me with the thing that my brain can never understand. So we're actually using the mind to guide the heart to actually connect to the essence of God, as opposed to actually understanding. So that's why when we learn this chapter, I know our brains are still going, oh, I can't understand this. You say, it's okay, brain, you're not gonna. Right? If the Rambam, the greatest genius who possibly ever lived, didn't, neither will I. But relax. You'll understand what you can slowly. We'll introduce it. We'll meditate on it. And then we'll get the heart to look. And the heart will see something that the mind won't. And then I'll have these feelings and then I'll be connected to God.
I'll be connected. You can connect with things you can't understand, trust me. So that's what we're doing. We're building these emotions that'll be the wings that'll elevate our life, our mitzvah. And I hope that gives you a sense that this chapter, it's not so far off. It's actually very, very close, as the Alter Rebbe said. Good? Good? All right, let's dive in. We are on page 735 here in chapter 48 of the Tanya. We're in the middle of it. So we've learned... You didn't tell us why we're reading. You told them. I'm not... Oh, you know, let's, let's do... In this room, let's do Cindy, Rick, and you. Okay. So you. So we learned, we learned in chapter uh, 46... Lost my train of thought. <laughs> right. Learn chapter 46 about this reflected love, which is the greater topic. That when I understand that God loves me, I will love God back automatically. And the whole mashal about the king. Then in 47, we learned it's not something back in history, coming out of Mitzrayim, that we should love God back for, or that we do. It's something that happens every day in the Shema. Now this chapter, we're taking a detour, learning about Tzimtzum, about how much God's holding back God's light, and that will lead to, we'll come back to this uh, topic of reflected love. So here we've learned about our two forms of light, and all the simsumim, all the contractions that God had to put in place to hold back that infinite light, and then create a light that could relate to the world. But there's even more. Go ahead, Linda. To, illustrate, to illustrate this point, consider this material world, even though the whole world is full of his glory. Now we're going to use a mashal to try and explain this better to... Uh, so I'm going to pull up on, on Facebook and see if anybody's asking any questions here on our feed. Hi there. So I'm watching you guys. Let me know any questions that come up in the comments. Hi, Michelle. Michelle, I'm going to bring you on camera, okay? I wonder what will happen if I do that. <clears throat> so, if you want, Michelle, you can come on camera and Facebook. Great. I got your thumbs up. I've never done that before. I don't know what will happen, but let me know. So now we're going to use a mashal, an illustration, to try and, again, teach this to my conscious mind. It says, think about, even though the whole world is full of God's glory, everything, even though this, this uh, infinite light we say is surrounding the world, it's actually right here. Namely, namely, not only the, the minute glamour of the godliness, but with the infinite light of the blessed Ain Sof, as it is written, do I not fill the heaven and the earth, says the Lord. And we're not talking about just that contracted light, we're talking about God's infinite light, God's surrounding light, that fills the heaven and the earth. It's right here, as we said. There are radio waves flowing right through me, as an example. I don't manifest them, I don't reflect them, I'm not sensitive to them, whereas my, my phone does, so you can see pictures on it. But the waves are going through me. Same thing with God's infinite light. It's right here, God fills the whole heaven and the earth. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, <laughs> Nevertheless, only very limited vitality of no more than the category of what is revealed in the inanimate and vegetable worlds is floated within this world in the form of revealed influence. So God's infinite light, God's absolute surrounding light is all here, right here. Still you're muted though. Oh, and yet, yeah. it's not, uh, it's not <laughs> revealed at all. No more than the category of what is, is in this world in the form of revealed. Absolutely. I think here, that right? might be and yet, it's my not, Facebook. Uh, it's not revealed. <laughs> is that coming from me or from you? Oh, man. We could use some tech help here. I close just a few windows. Okay. Are we good? Can you hear me now? I'll take that as a yes. So that infinite light is here, and yet the only thing that's manifest and revealed is that tiny amount of light that can actually create finite physical forms. Imagine there's this infinite light 
so expansive that the Alter Rebbe is saying, how could even the universe exist? How could even the spiritual worlds exist? Nothing, even the world of Bria, this great spiritual world with its archangels in it, that still is limited. That couldn't exist based on an original infinite light. And yet here I am, and I got a cup. I have a cup here, and I can measure exactly its dimensions. I can hold it in my hand. So it's such a minute amount of light that could create a physical cup. It, it's blowing the Alter Rebbe's mind. How is that possible to actually come when God's infinite light is right here? Imagine what's being hidden, right? While the whole Orin Sof Baruch Hu, Nikra, Sovev Aleha, Afshahu Betocha, Mamash. Are you, this, this, this will hear you. Okay. While all the light of the Blessed Ain Sof, which fills the world itself, is concealed in a concealed manner, is described as encompassing. It, even though it actually pervades it. Can you guys hear that? Yeah, good. So the light of the itself, which is encompassing, is still here. Right? It's still here. I'm looking at that physical cup. There's God right there. There's infinite light there, like every child knows. Since its influence is no more revealed in it, then it is revealed within the inanimate and vegetable worlds, but affects it in a hidden and concealed manner. Right? The, the surrounding light is not revealed in my cup. It's not revealed in the globe of the earth. It's not revealed in the Milky Way. It doesn't relate to anything, and yet it's right here. It's everywhere. V'chol hester nikra makif milmala. And we'll go back to Linda. Thanks. And any influence of a concealed nature is referred to as encircling from above. So he's reinforcing this point when we call it surrounding. We don't want we want to limit this idea of, of a geometric light that's around us. That's not here. That's like off somewhere else surrounding us. Surrounding doesn't mean it's not here. It is here. It just means it's completely hidden. And of course, this being Purim, we want to point out that's exactly the quality of Purim, that we have this whole story about politics and intrigue and genocide and back and forth, and God's not mentioned. But the sages recognized God's, God's hand was there in a hidden form. That's why Esther's name was Esther, from Hester, from exactly this word. So, so that light was right there in the king's court. It was right there in, in the back and forth of politics, just like it's right here in every other phenomenon. Ki alma discasia hulamala bimadrega me alma discalia. For alma discaccia, the hidden world is on a higher plane than alma discalia. Discalia? Yeah. The revealed world. So in this case, we're calling Atsilus, the highest spiritual world, the world of emanation, we're calling that the hidden world, alma discasia, that's Aramaic. And everything below that, the world of Bria, Yitzira, Asiya, and our physical world here, that's called Amadiskasya, the revealed world. So that's to, that's to, to highlight the point <clears throat> that the surrounding light is, is still infused right in the world. He's talking about the globe of the earth and how the globe of the earth has that surrounding light right running through it. And now we're going to go on and extend that metaphor to give us an example to try and relate to what this surrounding light is like using our own mind. So follow this. Let us make this more intelligible by means of an example. I like examples. So I'm going to sit back. Now I have something I can, I can you know, this, this is on my level, right? When a person forms an image in his mind of something that he has seen or sees... Ah, this we can do, right? So we, last week when we introduced this, we said, I could picture in my mind my car, right? So if everyone will do that, whatever vehicle, you, you, if you borrow, if you rent, if you drive a bike, picture your vehicle in your mind. That's easy. I have in my mind a picture of the car. The more I know about it, I can picture every detail inside, the, the motor, and, and in my case, the mess, because I'm a little bit not neat. I won't lie to you. 
when I was working at a synagogue in in, uh, in Toronto, Holy Blossom, um, you know, I, I just kind of came. I was I was freelance, right? So I'd show up, I'd do services, and I'd leave. And I, I didn't have an office there or anything. They offered me one; it was nice, but I, in the end, I didn't. Um, and when I was coming here to Temple Israel, uh, I was talking to who's now the head rabbi there, Rabbi Splansky, and I was talking about how I really was going to have to work on being very organized, taking over, you know, being being a cantor with a full pulpit. And she looks at me, she says, well, I thought you were the most organized person in the world. <laughs> Which anyone who knows me here knows that is the exact opposite. But I was able to just go up and, you know, with all my stuff prepped and then leave and no one could tell that behind it was, you know. But if you look at my car, if you even walk by my car, you're like, oh, that's someone with organizational issues right there. Right? So in my case, that's my car. I'm picturing it. And all of us have this image in our mind, this picture of our car. The question I'll ask is, is, does your car know that you're picturing it? The fact that I'm picturing my car, is that manifesting in any way with my actual car? Like, is my, does it change my car? If you walk by my car, would you know that I'm picturing it right now? No. Me holding my car in my mind has no relationship whatsoever to the actual car. All right, so let's go on. Uh, we did that. We did talk. Hine af she kol guf etzem hadavar havu vegabo v'tocho v'toch tocho kulo mitziyar bedato umachshavto mipne sherahu kulo or sheroehu. Ah, where we? Noreen, did you read? So Linda, why don't you go ahead? Even though the entire body and essence of that thing, both its exterior and interior, and its very core, are completely mirrored in his mind and thought. Has seen it or is seeing it in its entirety. Even though I'm here and I'm picturing my entire car, every detail of it, dato makefet hadavar hahu kulo. Let's go with uh, Cindy. This is expressed by saying that his mind encompasses that object completely. And just as in the mind's frame of reference, so too regarding the perspective of the visualized object. So we use the same concept, makif, enveloping, encompassing, to say my mind is encompassing that, in this case, that image of the car in my mind. My mind is surrounding it. Now in my mind, my mind is also in that car. When I say my mind is surrounding that car, I don't mean that my mind is here in a circle and the car is somewhere not in my mind. The car I'm picturing is also my mind. It is my mind, right? It's the same thing. And yet, the car that I'm picturing and the actual car itself, it's not, it doesn't express that I'm now thinking of it, right? I'm just encompassing it without affecting it in any way. And and that thing is enveloped by his mind and thought. So again, just like we say that there's a surrounding light and that the whole all the creation is enveloped completely, it's right here. That car picturing my mind is also enveloped by my mind and thought. <clears throat> but now we have, there's a distinction between God's thought, which we can't understand one of God's thought, and our thought. Right? So this is where we take the example up to the point where it'll help us, and then we recognize now there's a difference between us and God. But <laughs> But it is not encompassed in actual fact, only in the imagination of the man's thought and mind. So our imagination has the capacity to picture the form of something or an idea and encompass that. But now our thoughts here and God's thoughts here. So in our thought, it's just an image of the thing. It does not affect the actual thing. In God's thought, when God does what we're doing, God pictures something, that is what brings that thing into existence. That is the actual soul and essence of the thing, whether it's a cup or a galaxy or a person or whatever. So us doing this, this exercise of picturing a car lets us understand what surrounding light is like because we're picturing something that we're not having any effect on. And yet in God's case, even as God's thought is not having any effect on the world, is not manifest in any way and is completely removed from it, it's still, is the soul of that thing. It allows that thing to exist, right? And that's the point, like I said, where our mind is gonna go, whoa, 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 
right? Like, we can't even understand one of God's thoughts, as the author of will say, so don't worry, right? If, if your mind hits, a, hits a, a barrier there, that's the negative knowledge we have about God. We know that God's thoughts are not like our thoughts. We know that we cannot grasp one of God's thoughts. We know we can't understand how God knowing about the planet Earth is actually creating the planet Earth, and in fact, that is God. God's the knower, the knowledge, and the known all at the same time, right? So, but I can understand that that's beyond me, and that gives me a little negative knowledge that I can meditate on. So when it says God took notice of Sarah, that's how he did it. That's how he created, she created. Right? So, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the comment was, when it says God took notice of Sarah, that's how Sarah's being created? Well, that's how she got pregnant. Yes and no. So, 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 you know, we have this thing like when we say, uh, 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 you know, that, that the memory of something should come up and you should focus on me, you should remember me in the prayer, that we do. Um, when something exists, it means that God wants it and God's thinking about it somewhere in whatever God's thought is, right, which is beyond us. So everything that exists, God's aware of it, God's thinking of it. When we say, now God noticed something or God remembers something, that's more to do with now, is that God's in, internal will? Is that God's external will? Is that, is that what we said, the hind part of God's will? Like how close to the initial spark of will that God had in mind is that, right? So everything that exists, God knows about. And God's knowledge of it, that is the soul of the thing. So, so it's kind of a yes and no. Do you know what I mean? When we say God remembered Sarah, God noticed Sarah, whatever word you want to use, that's talking about, oh yeah, this whole idea of creation, it had to do with this family and this people, these Jewish people, and they're doing these mitzvahs, and this, oh yeah, this is important. So God's now focusing whatever it being closer to God's internal will is, right? That's, that's a very mysterious thing. That's the change you're talking about. Question. Yeah. So... You, the, the example of the car is so bad, yeah? It's the, the income thing. When we pray and we pray the Mishaberach for somebody, is that an example of the other light, the internal light, the light that fills us? I mean, really, it's both. I, I, and so the question is, when you're praying for healing for someone, is that... Solvev surrounding light or Mamala filling light. And really, it's both. In this metaphor, we simplified, but right. you could say the fact that I'm thinking of a particular person, the fact that I'm thinking that they have, uh, you know, that the, God forbid their arm is broken, they should heal, I'm thinking of that particular part of them. You're also involving or Mamala because you're praying for that particular person, for that particular organ of their physical body. Mm -hmm. But you're also bringing in the Or Solvev because when we pray, we're contacting the light that's beyond the world and we're through our prayers, bringing that to be manifest impossibly in the physical world, right? Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's always a combo. Okay. Yeah. The Alter Rebbe is simplifying this for us for the conversation, but it's always both. The world is being created by both these lights at the same time, not in a way you could explain simply. Uh, let us make this more intelligible. Let's make this more intelligible by means of an example. And Linda, you'll read next. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah, Bottom of 737. God, however, of whom it is written, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. So it is utterly impossible for us to grasp his thought process. Here we go. Now we've hit the end of where we can follow the metaphor, and we hit something beyond which we can't understand. That is, not even one thought of God can I begin to understand. How is it that God is the knowledge, knower, and known, altogether, unified with no divisions, and that that knowledge is what gives life and the soul to every created thing? Forget it, right? Uh, Cindy, go ahead. Okay. 
His thoughts and his mind, which knows all created beings, encompasses each and every created thing from its head, that is its highest level, to its end, that is its lowest level, and its inside and very core, all in actual reality, and not as with the thought of mortal man. And this, this was probably incredible to people in the Alter Rebbe's time. Okay, I can, I can try and grasp that God is aware of the whole cosmos and the spiritual worlds. I get it. It's macro, right? But then that God is also at the same time aware of every little detail inside everything at the same time, somehow to me that's more mind-boggling than that God's just aware that there's how many trillions of stars or whatever, right? But in the Alter Rebbe's time, when you think about the detail they understood of the world, that must have been mind-boggling. But now look at every time we go inside deeper and deeper to reality with, with uh, a microscope and, and then with particle accelerators, no matter how deep we go, God's able to track that much detail of every spot in the universe, every physical point. God's tracking that much detail down to all the research we can possibly do with particle accelerators to see what's going on with those crazy muons and things. Right? It's, it's, trying to grasp this in our time when we have gained so much more insight into the the details of physical and quantum reality now just the amount of attention that god has to detail it boggles the mind to think that that's if that's the case with with just one you know one one mole of, of mass that that's the case with the entire universe also but that's infinity right we, we can never catch it Lamashal, Kadur Haaretz, Ha Lezu Hare, Yidiato, Yitbarech, Makevet, Kol Ovi, Kadur Haaretz, Vichol Asher Betucho, Betuch Tucho Ad Tachtito, Hakol Befual Mamash. For example, in the case of the orb of this, of this orb, his knowledge encompasses the entire dynamic, dynamiter of the globe of the orb, together with all that is and its deepest interior to its lowest depths, all of actual reality. And again, think of what people in the Alter Rebbe's time knew about biology and number of species and diversity, and now multiply that by what we know and think every possible organism, and science has only scratched the surface of how, how mammals work, how, how every other kingdom works, how, I don't know if the mammal's a kingdom, I forget, but Think of every single living thing, all the possible detail down to its quantum roots, and that's what God's thought is aware of, of everything. It's, it's just, it's, it's so incredibly far beyond. And that, that God's knowledge of all that, that's what's giving it its life. That's what's giving it its life. You know, I think because I teach this class, things come up on my Facebook feed about, about uh, physics and, and, and philosophy. And one came across my feed this morning that, uh, you know, some scientists are postulating that the universe, that consciousness does not emerge out of physical matter, like people thought the brain can trigger consciousness, nor is consciousness something separate that the brain connects to, but actually consciousness is just infused in the fabric of the universe to begin with. That the universe itself is consciousness, and then the material world kind of evolves out of that. And that's what the Alter Rebbe said. That's what, that's what the Ar Arizal said. It's not that God and the world are separate. The world is God. The world is godliness itself. And so consciousness, of course, is emerging out of that phenomenon. It's just all this is just God's energy, God's will, God's thought. The world comes out of that. And so consciousness is just part and parcel of that, right? Just some things, some things are a vessel that can express self-awareness, like a human being and like mammals. Some things are not a vessel that expresses self-awareness, like the cap of my camera, etc. But in this case, now we see that's what God's thought is. God's thought is so infinitely complex that it's being aware of every detail, of every, every micron of the planet Earth and beyond, and that that is what gives it life. So good, good luck tracking that. We know that's beyond us. <laughs> Were it not. Okay. 
we started saying, don't worry, it's gonna, you know, we, we relax, yeah, we can understand this. Don't worry about it, it'll all be explained. But, but it's still is the moach. <laughs> this is the moach of the Tanya. This is Mem Chet, right, chapter, chapter 48. So it's the brains of the Tanya. It's, it's a profound chapter, and you can come back to this, right? I forget where I am. Where am I? Uh, back to Linda, I think. No. Oh, no, nor this knowledge it. constitutes the vitality of the whole spherical thickness of the earth and its creation ex nihilo. So that that knowledge, God's knowledge of everything in the earth, that is the vitality of the earth. That is its soul. That is what is bringing it into life at every moment. That's a true reality, right? It has no other reality outside of God's knowledge of it, which is creating it. However, it would not have come into being as it is now, as a finite and limited thing with an exceedingly minute degree of vitality sufficient for the categories of inorganic matter and vegetation. And Lindy will be next. So here he's talking about the entire earth. He's saying that this entire earth that we're on, our whole world, there's no way such a, such a tiny glimmer of God's energy could have possibly created something that finite as the planet Earth, right? Because even in his time, they knew the planet Earth, it was not infinite. It, you know, it had a certain size. It had a certain mass. And there's no way you could get a finite mass, even the planet Earth, out of an infinite light without these special contractions we're talking about. Were it not for the world being created through the many powerful contractions which condense the light and vitality that is clothed in the orb of the earth. Cindy? So as to animate it and sustain it in its finite and limited status, and in the categories of inorganic and vegetable matter alone. Right, so we're going from this whole mashal, this whole image of us imagining whatever, a car, or you can imagine the planet Earth, right? We've seen these gorgeous pictures. I can hold the planet Earth in my mind. Does someone walking outside on the ground know that I'm picturing the Earth? No. Does the Earth express it? No. That's just an encompassing thing. In my case, I'm not actually encompassing the earth, but in God's case, that thought that encompasses the earth, that is the life force and vitality of the earth. And it's because of these simsumim, because of these contractions we learned about, that God's encompassing light, which should not be able to create anything as finite as the planet earth, was able to hold back enough so that there could be just a little ray of light that was carved and shaped and held back just enough so that something finite could finally be formed. And there's a whole world of study there of the different contractions that happen even between the different worlds and there's infinite contractions in between them and the light of one world is infinite compared to the light below it. Um, but we're not gonna go deep into that because this book is about bringing it close to me. It's not about going into the uh, Kabbalah. Ach, idiato yiparech ha miyuchedet b'mauto v'atzmuto. His knowledge, however, which is all, is united with his essence and being, for he is the knowledge, the knower, and the knower. As we said, Kihu Hamada, Right, so there's this world, and no matter how big a phenomenon, I'm, God's picturing it, God's light's encompassing, and, and it's finite, so God has to contract. But even though there's all these contractions that allow a finite thing, that's still godliness. That's still united with God. God's not, you can't say God's knowledge is now separate from God just because the earth seems like it's separate or my cup seems like it's separate, right? This is still, God's right here. You can't bow to it. You can't pray to it, obviously, but God's right here. And knowing himself as it were, he knows all created beings though not with the knowledge that is external to himself like the knowledge of a human being. Right, so how does God, how does God know everything in the world? You know, children sometimes ask, well, you know, does God have a big eyeball that's invisible that's floating around looking everywhere? No, it's God's abstract and infinitely above that, right? The power of sight 
is an abstract emanation from God, and my eye is just a vessel that gets filled with that power of sight. So to me, if I lose the vessel, now I can't, I can't express the power anymore. That doesn't mean that God needs an eye to see, right? The power of sight is more abstract and more powerful than a vessel that is able to see. So how does God know the whole world? The same way I know myself, right? If I, if I, uh, I happen to have a little calf injury, you might've noticed at our Purim spiel last night, I wasn't doing my usual, my usual boogie. I was kind of taking it easy. I keep hurting my calf. I don't need to take a, 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 you know, I don't need a bachelor's degree to understand that my calf is injured and when I walk, it hurts, right? That's in me. I know it because I know myself. It's direct knowledge like that, right? And, and if I walk the wrong way, I, <laughs> I know it's in me, right? So I, no one needs to explain it. I don't need a process. I, if it's in me, I know it's there. I know it by knowing myself. That's the metaphor for how God knows the world. Right? A young child might think, oh, I have an eye, so I need an eye to see. I close my eyes, I can't see, so God must have an eye. No. I have a hurt calf, and it's causing me pain, and I know that. Well, guess what? God's knowledge is what's creating the entire world. And so God, by knowing God's self, is aware of the entire world, including every detail of every point within the whole globe of the earth and beyond. That's how God's knowledge works. Now, for us to try and imagine that our knowledge is also creating us and that it's infinite, that's beyond us. But we can tell. We know from knowing ourselves. So that's how God knows the world. Um, I'll just explain the next point. Then we'll do a little meditation. I think we probably digested enough. Rick's got his arms crossed. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> so he's going to, he, he has to point out, because there were, you know, there were a few debates, ongoing debates. The Maharal objected with the Rambam about this definition, that God is, God is one with God's chokhmah, or God is the knowledge knower and the known. Because the Maharal said, you can't define God. You can't say God is the knowledge, the knower, and the known altogether. That's, that's a definition. God's, inf God's so much, God created knowledge, right? So how can you, how can you take God and, and give that definition? That's heresy, right? There's a huge debate. And uh, the Rambam was on this side, the Maharal was on this side, you know, different generations, obviously. And the author Rebbe came, and he's going to explain now, Kabbalah agrees with the Rambam, that God is the knowledge nowhere known, even though it's true the Maharal is saying you can't define God. But the difference is, once God comes down into the worlds, into the vessels, now you can say God is the knowledge nowhere known. Because in relationship to Chochmah bin Andat, that God's united with, yeah, God is knowledge nowhere known, all united. But above that, above Atsilus, now you can't say God is knowledge nowhere known. So the, the Mahara was talking about before this big Tsimsum that started all the spiritual worlds, and the, uh, the, the Rambam was talking about after that, once God's simple light enters into the vessels, and now you can say that. So, you know, the Altar Rebbe will clear up that argument for us next week. But we'll, we'll start next week at, at the top of 740. Let's do a little meditation. Because like we said, the point of all this is not just to create kind of cool playthings in our mind, even though it's fun. I like these ideas. They're, they're, they're fascinating. But the point is now to teach them to our heart and let our heart do the looking. So for that, we need our meditation. Let's take a, thanks, thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks, Emily, for being with us on Facebook. Uh, good to have you. If anyone wants to join the class, just email maya at temple-israel.org. We'd love to have you in person, uh, on the screen, however you'd like. Nice deep breath. Let's lengthen our spine. Let our mind come to rest. Whatever we've absorbed or whatever questions you might have, let's, let's leave that for a moment. Just tuck that away. Very good to meditate on a day like Purim because there's extra channels that are open for us so we can perhaps perceive more and connect more and also create more light, be more productive in our meditation. Allow our breath to even out and slow down. So follow with me. We're going to do four counts for each of the four stages of breath. So four to breathe in, four to keep the breath in, four to breathe out, 
for it to remain empty, if you can, through your nostrils with your mouth shut, starting with me breathing in, two, three, four. Keep the breath in, two, three, four. Release out, two, three, four. Nice and empty, stay there, two, three, four. Starting over, in, two, three, four. Keep the breath in. Two, three, four. Breathing out. Two, three, four. Stay empty. Two, three. Keep that pattern yourself. Feel free to pause your device if you're watching in the future and let this pattern settle in, not for too long, just a few minutes. We don't need to stay here with our mind empty. Just creating a level playing field to introduce our divine concept. Let's open up our wisdom gateway as the space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. In that opening, that space, that emptiness, create your own gateway for wisdom to enter. Take some time to let that solidify this wisdom gateway. If you're picturing it as a small projected screen in your mind, perhaps enlarge the screen many fold. If you're picturing it in grays or blacks and whites, picture it in color. If it's still, perhaps let it be animated. And of course, if you're not there in the gateway, put yourself in the gateway, relate to it. With this gateway established, let's put this divine concept in our gateway. As you've learned, God's knowledge of a thing is the life force of the thing. And so God's knowledge of me, that is my life force. And what is, what is the source of this breath? It's just God's knowledge of my breath. That is what's creating the breath. life force behind everything. That is just God's knowledge, God's awareness of that thing. It's one with God. Let's put that beautiful, profound concept in our gateway. And let the depth of it, let the breadth of it, let all the images flowing out fill your mind. Flowing deep down towards the root of your mind, filling up towards the top of your mind, and flowing into every possible detail that your mind can come up with. There's many, many levels of depth, many gates to this concept, so I'll let your mind flow into it. As your mind is full of this concept, filled to the brim, notice any emotions, maybe even just kernels of emotions. Perhaps gratitude that God has always been completely aware of you, giving you your life force just through that awareness. As I often say, good to stay in this meditative posture of mind and body for 10, 15, 20 minutes. But if you're here in our class, we're gonna wrap up. So wiggle your toes and your fingers, open your eyes. I had a very funny thought. <laughs> I was trying not to stare. It's Purim, so I'm just, my mind is thinking of gags. I'm always thinking, you know, when I'm leading the breathing, I'm counting when I'm breathing in, but of course I'm cheating because I have to breathe out when I'm counting. So I thought maybe I should train myself to speak breathing in for the counting. And would that help your meditation <laughs> if I went 
breathing in for one, two, three, four. <laughs> so I didn't share that. That was Simpson. I held back my. I could probably do a better job, right? One, two, three, four. <laughs> you do that. It's a good gag, though, for for this class. Anyways. It's been a pleasure learning with you. I wish everybody a uh, really freilich and purim. You should uh, be able to see God's essence in every detail of the world today. Know that this is a time when that which is hidden, uh, we can get a connection to it, we can get a feel for it, and, and it's a, a good day to do good things for people. All right. See you next time. Sei gesund and, and uh, have a good week. One, two, three, four. <laughs> yeah. How did the uh, Purim spiel go last night? What do people think? How did it go? It's good. I thought it was great. Exactly. It was, uh, it's good. It's great. It was wasn't fun like good? normal, though. <laughs> Is it really vanilla? Very good, very good. Yeah. No, we did good. Yeah. So I think it went well. People enjoyed it. Was it really vanilla? Yeah, I thought it was really vanilla. I didn't make any yeah. my usual outrageous jokes. Maybe that's how it should be. Maybe I'm not supposed to. Maybe I'm at a point in my life where I'm not supposed to be making sexual jokes and things. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Then why? But, then why didn't you record it? So we, could, the rest of us, could. Well, see. now we're having a staff meeting. Now we're having a staff meeting. So that is a very good question. But ah. We become a very complicated place, and people are very sensitive to a lot of things. So. Uh. I would have you know, loved to it's see like, it. It's like, it's like asking of a family dinner, you know, why does so-and-so sit there? I, you know, it's just, it's, it's a very, it's a very okay. complex place. So we didn't record it because we decided not to. Okay. I would have loved to see it. <laughs> I know, I know. I heard from many people that said they wish that we had streamed it. I totally understand. Uh, but, you know, we're working a team. So, so, you know, somebody would be upset with any decision we made around Quorum. It's people are very sensitive to me because they know it's like so touches them so deeply. I don't know, but also comedy people get sensitive about. <laughs> so I'm sorry you missed it. Yeah, me too. Every year. Best joke though. I'll show you the best joke. No, it was no. The be the best joke I think was that uh, they said uh, that the king the king really embarrassed Haman because Haman had to you know lead Mordechai around on a horse while announcing his wordle scores. See, so it was that kind of joke. It was those those kind of jokes. It was nice, lighthearted jokes. The best was when Jen got up and at the end and it was explaining things and everything she said <laughs> had a double entendre to it. And you guys were, you know. Yes, that was that was close as I got to. Uh, that was funny. Good. Yeah. All right. Have a good have a good forum. I'll see you guys soon. <laughs>